the Asus Z170A. We're going to take a look. And it's really bad. You should not shake the box, but I like shaking the box because I'm a crazy person. The A series boards are always a really interesting board to look at. I always look forward to looking at those from Asus because they're always really interesting. The X99, the A series, the Z87A, Z97 series. The tradition sort of continues with the Z170A. I'm sort of a no-nonsense person. It's like, I like things that have bling, but things that have bling is not the buying point for me. It is features, it is what does it do. And the Z170A, it always, it always sort of struck me that Asus has put a lot of work into figuring out exactly what the cool stuff is and really sort of pouring it all into the Z170A or the A-series motherboards in general. They don't put quite as much cool stuff in the A as, say, the Deluxe, but the A is quite a bit less expensive than the Deluxe, for example. So Asus has a ton of different motherboard parts. There's the Hero, there's, you know, mainstream boards, there's OEM boards that are even less expensive that are designed for system builders and things like that. And so there's, you know, virtually no bling on those motherboards and the features are kind of limited in comparison. But the A series generally, historically, has given you a pretty good balance of overclockability and onboard features and other features that are not necessarily related to overclocking. In this case, we're gonna talk a lot about the fan controller on this one because Asus has one up themselves with their onboard fan controller stuff, even on the A. So we're gonna take a look at that, but we gotta go into the UEFI to do that. Let's take a quick look at the chipset. Now this is a Skylake motherboard, meaning that it is socket 1151. It's gonna work with the i5-6500 or the i7-6600. Uh, K processors, probably other processors because there's going to be more than those two, but they're not out yet. And so I don't know what those models are, but SOC 1151, Skylake, those are the kinds of things you should look for in the processor. Uh, this is for the sixth generation, you know, Core i5, Core i7, i3, Pentium, Celeron processors that are available in socket 1151. This is the Z170 Express chipset. It's got four DIMMs, support for up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4. The motherboard is certified for DDR4 3400. That's an overclock, 3333 and 2133, the regular speed. Non-ECC unbuffered memory. It has two PCI Express 3 by 16 slots. So that's that can operate it by 16 or by 8 by 8. It has one PCI Express 3 slot at a uh, maximum of by four. That's actually for your NVMe PCI Express SSD. And you've got three PCI Express 3.0 by one slots and one PCI slot. So if you've got a legacy PCI device, the Z170A has one PCI slot for you. Now the Skylake CPU has a built-in GPU, the Intel HD, you know, 530, whatever happens to be built into your GPU. And in terms of uh, monitor out options, this motherboard actually gives you four options. You've got your legacy VGA port, which I thought was an interesting choice in this day and age that, hey, VGA is still a thing. No, not really, but hey, that's okay. You've also got DisplayPort, HDMI, and DVI-D. Now, the DisplayPort connection will actually support 4K at 60 hertz. It's the multi-stream thing, so it's an Intel thing, so you gotta take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. It's not exactly the same as the DisplayPort support that you would find in a full graphics card, but you can do 4K at 60 hertz, and you can also do daisy chaining with the DisplayPort, but the daisy chaining is not a new feature for the Z170 chipset and Skylake CPUs. Now, we've got one SATA Express port, six SATA 6 ports, uh, two ports from the SATA Express connection. We've got the one M.2 socket 3 with the M key, so that supports both the PCI and the SATA uh, mode. So you can run this at PCI Express 3x4 or SATA. It has one Intel i219V gigabit LAN. It has a Realtek RTL 892 8 channel high definition audio codec featuring Crystal Sound 3, DTS Studio Sound, and DTS Connect. It has one Type A USB 3.1 at the back panel, and it has one USB Type C at the back panel, six USB 3 ports and six USB 2 ports. Now this motherboard has uh, a feature that has shown up in the channel motherboards called five-way optimization. What five-way optimization does is it's, there's basically a controller and an external clock generator. Asus has an external clock generator that's good for up to 400 megahertz. With Skylake, the clocks for the PCI Express and the DMI and memory are all decoupled on Devil's Canyon and Haswell, they were all coupled together. So if you wanted to overclock, you were gonna end up overclocking your bus. There was a little bit of an ability to play with the multiplier, but it was not as flexible as Skylake. With Skylake, all of that is decoupled, and so Asus has actually put on an external clock generator. So if you're gonna be doing extreme overclocking, it's there, but the difference between 200 and 400 megahertz, you're probably not gonna see that. 
But with the five-way optimization, you can actually enter the UEFI and basically have the system overclock itself. You can also use the AI suite and have the system overclock itself. And so on the Z170 Deluxe, which is you know their flagship motherboard, we ran this, we ran this with this i7. We were able to get 4.8 on two cores, 4.7 on the other two cores. Re repeated that test on the Z170A and we got identical results. Now the fastest DDR4 memory that I have is DDR4 3400. And at DDR4 3400, with, that's with an overclock, and that was an overclock of the XMP profile. The, the memory kit was actually DDR4 3200. I was able to get it to run at 3400 by playing with the timings, loosening them a little bit, that kind of thing. The motherboard was actually stable with, the, uh, with four sticks of DDR4 3400. So that's pretty good. The Deluxe actually advertises a higher overclock than the Z170A for the memory. 3466 is the maximum overclock that the Z170 Deluxe reports, whereas DDR4 3400 is what the Z170A reports. I can't push past 3400 with any memory kit that I have, so I can't say that, oh yeah, the Z170A will actually work at a higher speed, they just don't advertise that. Now I can tell you that the power delivery circuitry is a little bit simplified compared to the Z170 Deluxe, but again, 4.8, which realistically is probably the ceiling that you're going to get at, even with a good liquid cooler on the, the current Skylake series CPUs. I can hit 4.8 and it was stable on a Z170A. So if you if you can do more than 4.8 on a Skylake, you've got a unicorn of a chip. So good job. And it's stable, yeah, that's really good. So this motherboard does support NVMe, PCI Express, SSD RAID. If you've got two of the Intel 750s, you can use those in RAID 1 or RAID 0. Although keep in mind that the total amount of DMI 3.0 bandwidth that you have is four gigabytes per second. If you wanna learn more about the PCI Express arrangement and like how that works and which slots go where because the two slots go to the CPU and then the DMI is, you know, PCI Express by four interface for all of the rest of your peripherals. You should go watch our Skylake video that's just info about the platform to learn, you know, how all that is arranged and how all that's put together. But for now, suffice it to say, you can do NVMe RAID and then unless you have the Intel SSDs or the or the Samsung 950 or the 951, you are not going to bottleneck. If you've got, you know, two or three of the Plexer M.2 SSDs, which we like and which are way more affordable, than the Intel 750s. You can RAID those and you're, you're not gonna bottleneck. You're gonna hit, you know, two gigabytes per second with two or three of those in RAID. So that's pretty good. Now Asus has done something a little different with the LAN. They've actually bundled um, network optimization software. This is really packet prioritization quality of service software that is aware of games and is sort of aware of different things that would need different priorities as far as packet prioritization goes. And that's built on top of the Intel i219 gigabit LAN interface. And so we're seeing packet prioritization on the Intel side of things. Now, typically some manufacturers may use, you know, a Realtek or a different other controller for a second network interface. This motherboard only has one network interface. It's an Intel network interface, so that's good. And then they also bundle the packet prioritization software. So you really get the best of both worlds with that setup. Now this is uh, sort of the same color scheme and sort of the same, the same color design as we've seen in other Asus channel motherboards, but the power delivery system here is a little simplified versus what we saw on the Deluxe. And with the Deluxe, we had the combined heat pipe and the, the fancier heat sink assembly. Here we just have, you know, two separate heat sinks and they're gonna expect airflow from the case or from the CPU cooler. There is plenty of room around the CPU socket. Uh, the capacitors maybe are crowding the CPU socket a little bit, but they're low profile capacitors, and so I don't think you're gonna have any problems with any of the tower coolers. We tested a bunch of different tower coolers from Noctua and a whole bunch of others, and we didn't have any problems with any of the tower coolers that we tested. And of course, all-in-one water coolers are also fine. At the bottom edge of the board, we've got the SPDIF output, the front panel connector the serial connector, an onboard mechanical power switch, a TPM interface. We've got our Thunderbolt header for our ASUS Thunderbolt expansion option. So, so if you're gonna run a PCI Express Thunderbolt adapter, then you'll wanna plug in the Thunderbolt expansion uh, card here. Then we've got our two USB 2.0 front panel connectors. This gives you a total of four USB 2.0 ports. We've got our second USB 3 front panel interface connector. We've also got support here for our external fan controller. Now, if you remember from the Z170 Deluxe, we actually have the other fan controller board, the breakout board, that gives you the option of being able to control a huge set of fans. This is sort of a, this has sort of become a standard peripheral from Asus to where it's like, ah, you want, you know, you want more fan control, you want more fan control directly from the UEFI. We've got a breakout board that gives you DC and PWM control of all of the fans, and this sort of breaks it out. 
but we've got another fan header and we're going to talk a little bit more about the fan header in a minute the easy xmp switch uh, front panel connector and the tpu switches now let's talk for just a second about these switches most memory kits that you would use with skylake have two built-in profiles. They have a profile where the memory runs at 2133, that's the default speed of DDR4, and then they have another profile called the Extreme Memory Profile, or XMP. Usually you have to go into the UEFI and you have to tell the UEFI, hey, don't use the default speed of 2133, use the speed that the memory is rated at. Generally, that speed requires increasing the voltage that's delivered to the memory, but it's supported by the manufacturer. So in our case, we're using G-Skill DDR4 uh, rip jaws. This is DDR4 3000, and so it does have an extreme memory profile or XMP configuration that we'll want to load. The TPU switch kind of works the same way, but it's around the power delivery system for the CPU. And so if you're using a really crappy CPU cooler, you'll probably leave it on the default switch. If you're gonna use an air cooler or a really lightweight all-in-one cooler, you might use the middle setting. And if you've got a good all-in-one water cooler, you would probably use the far setting. And that tells the motherboard sort of what sort of cooling solution to expect on the CPU. And so when you're th doing things like running the, uh, you know, running the auto overclock or running the five way optimization and doing the other things like that, that it sort of tells the motherboard what to expect as far as cooling and, and how aggressive it can be as far as uh, overclocks and power delivery. And so of course the most extreme option will generate the most heat needs the best cooling options, needs the most fans in the case and that sort of thing. And so you'll, you'll want to be sure that you set that, you know, to the switch. Of course, you don't have to use the switch. You can still just go through the UEFI, but if you want the easy button solution, you can do that and, you know, do the auto button. You're good to go. Now, in this case, the Z170A does not come with the fan expansion board, but you can buy it later as an accessory and control even more fans. So in terms of the fan control support, this motherboard actually has seven fan headers with one header dedicated for water pump control. We're talking about, you know, seven fan headers, full DC and PWM control. The UEFI, they've really outdone themselves this time in terms of the fan control situation. So um, one of the things that some people complained about in the last couple of generations was that when you change from one preset to another, that it doesn't ramp slowly. You can now actually pick that in the UEFI. There's an option for picking how you ramp the speed of the fan from one from one level to another. If you do that over 30 seconds or you do that over five seconds or you do it immediately, however you want to do that, you have the option in the UEFI to pick how you ramp the fan speed. That's not just on the Z170A, that's also on the Z170 Deluxe and the other boards in the channel series, probably also other boards even uh, other than that, but I haven't gotten to those yet, so <laughs> we'll see. So in the UEFI, you can also pick for every fan header if it's DC or PWM mode. Now this UEFI also adds another feature, which is auto fan calibration. You can go into the UEFI and you can basically let it automatically calibrate your fans. Go into the UEFI, set the option, and it will ramp all of the fan headers up and down. It will find the minimum DC or PWM levels to actually spin the fan. It'll find the minimum RPMs of the fan and the maximum RPMs of the fan so that the calibration curves and the controls that you set for the fans can be exactly what you want. So if you want a system that's whisper quiet or you want a system that you really have fine grained control of the fans, this motherboard's got that feature. So what have you got in the box? Well, in the box, you've got the user installation manual, you've got the uh, CD, you've got the backplate cover, you've got three SATA cables, you've got your Q connectors and you've got your SLI bridge, and then you've got a little bit of mounting hardware for an M.2 SSD. And that's pretty much it. No frills, nothing gets in the way, no extra stuff. More than three SATA cables might be nice, but honestly, who would even use three in this day and age? You know, isn't everything M.2? And that's pretty much it for the box. This does support U.2, but you'd have to get the adapter to do that so that you go from the M.2 slot to the little mini SAS connector and then a cable out from there or, you know, the SATA Express to, to whatever interface if you want to do it that way. You know, what, however you're going to do the connection. All in all, it's been a pretty solid board and I'm, I'm happy that I was able to hit 4.8 on the overclocks on that. I'm happy that I was able to hit 3400 on the memory uh, at the maximum end for maximum overclock. The G-Skill memory was of course pretty great. And for the cooler, I was also sort of messing around with this Captain 240 Deep Cool cooler, which did a pretty good job keeping it cool even at 4.8. Had a little trouble keeping up with uh, some of the insane, you know, like 8 to 64 burn-in testing, but for real-world performance and doing gaming at 4.8, I was able to keep up, and it's a relatively compact unit. There's really only two options uh, right now for USB 3.1, the Intel Alpine Ridge and As Media. Uh, and this particular motherboard provides its USB 3.1 connectivity through an As Media controller, so just keep that in mind. So overall, the verdict on this, this motherboard delivers a really solid set of features at a really aggressive price point. I would like to see more USB connectivity included in the box. Maybe they could throw in a USB 2 
a header, breakout header, or something like that. But honestly, you can pick up one of those for a couple of bucks, so it's not really a big deal. Overall, in terms of features and value, the A series always impresses me with the value that they bring, and this motherboard is no exception. I really like it. If you're going to build a system with one of these, or you have built a system with one of these, let us know what your thoughts and impressions are, and we'll see you in the forums. I'm Wendell, and I'm signing out. I'll see you later.